Hello and, and welcome to CSDS. Uh, my name is Avdhendra Sharan and I'm very happy to welcome our speaker this evening or this afternoon, Professor Swain Opitz. Professor Opitz is Professor of Political Sociology at Phillips University, Marburg. He has a background in social theory and science and technology studies, and his research focuses on global health security and biopolitics after the microbial turn. Uh, this is from the official page. Uh, several of us have been reading him for a length of time now, and it's, it's remarkable how even before the current round of pandemic, there's so much that Professor Opitz has written, uh, which has relevance for us today. Uh, he's written about disease modeling and what it tells us about the social world, about fears and affect, uh, about administrative protocols and global health regulations that limit circulation uh, at specific points and in specific ways and about illiberal governmentality. All of these issues are very much with us today, and we couldn't have asked for a better speaker to address us this evening. The title for Professor Opitz's talk today is Atmo Social Condition, Ecologies of Breath After COVID-19. So welcome, Professor Opitz, and welcome, everyone. Uh, after Professor Opitz has delivered his lecture, uh, those who may want to ask questions, you can put it in the Q&A box and he will respond to those. Uh, thank you, Professor Opitz. Thank you so much for, for the kind introduction and, and the invitation. It's, it's always beautiful to hear that, that other people uh, find your work, um, <clears throat> yes, productive. It's a very, very nice thing to hear. <clears throat> Let me... Let me now share my screen and start the presentation. So hopefully you can see the presentation now, right? Okay. In an open letter published last year on July 6, scientists from 39 countries declared that, I quote, it is time to address airborne transmission of COVID-19. They demanded to take into consideration scientific evidence showing that, and I quote further, viruses are released during exhalation, talking and coughing in micro droplets small enough to remain aloft in air and pose a risk of exposure at distances beyond one to two meters beyond an infected individual. The open letter was primarily directed at public health authorities worldwide. Most notable, the WHO did not recommend precautions against airborne infections at the time. A WHO tweet on March 28 in 2020 implicitly even accused those of misinformation who considered the airborne pathway to be relevant. In the initial phase of the pandemic, the possibility of infection via the inhalation of aerosols was sidelined by two other modes of transmission. First, the infection through the impact of droplets on eyes, nose, or mouth and second, the infection through the touch of contaminated surfaces. These modes of transmission have dominated uh, the public health reasoning throughout the whole 20th century. Airborne transmission, in contrast, has long been regarded as marginal, limited to a comparatively small number of infectious diseases. <clears throat> Today, more than a year after the onset of this controversy, the status of aerosol has changed. The controversy has transformed them into a public thing that has been recognized as a matter of vital concern. Not only have public health institutions from the WHO to the CDC in the US or the Robert Koch Institute in Germany changed their guidelines and fact sheets. Mounting epidemiological evidence for airborne transmission supported by steady news coverage has made a broader audience highly attentive to the issue. According to Norte Mares, implication in an affair 
is what sparks public involvement. In the COVID-19 pandemic, the implication of virtual every breathing human body in the affair around aerosols eventually turned the surrounding air from an implicit background into a highly fraught entity. Ambient air could not any longer be taken for granted as a resource to be safely consumed. Rather, the need to breathe in and out became a risk interval. The necessity to breathe out produces a risk for others. The necessity to breathe in puts the body at risk. In this way, COVID-19 rendered ecologies of breath deeply problematic. Atmospheres, in the literal sense of breathing spaces, appeared at the same time as indispensable for life and as pathogenic. The immersion of the living into an atmospheric milieu, to quote Peter Slotterdijk here, has become tantamount to the immersion into a milieu ridden by the possibility of viral encounter. In this lecture today, I claim that the particular atmospheric space publicly opened up in the pandemic also contains a lesson for my discipline, which is sociology. Attending closely to the controversy over airborne transmission may contribute to an understanding of air as a social medium and thereby attune the social to its elemental dimension. Under COVID-19, breathable air did not remain merely a background condition of social life. It could not be any longer relegated into an Umwelt neatly separated from social interactions. The debate on airborne transmission reveals instead that the social does not only proceed in atmospheres, but through atmospheres. This view builds on Tim Ingold's observation that the very essence of conviviality lies in the sharing of breath, as he writes. Collective breathing is a constitutive part of speaking and listening, gesticulating and acting, acting on or with each other, sometimes merely in proximity to each other. Collective breathing and shared atmospheres is part of a multitude of social practices, such as shopping, using public transport, standing in elevators, visiting museums, or going to the gym. In all of these practical settings, we are today experiencing a health risk that emerges from our bodily being with and being alongside. SARS-CoV-2 thus highlights an infectious quality of the social it has acquired through the aerosol pathway. I want to take up this challenge to reflect on the atmosocial relations we have learned to take into account into our day, in our daily practices. I will follow the current problematization of the aerosol in order to think the social through ecologies of breath. And I proceed in three steps. First, I look at how the notion of airborne transmission relativizes techniques of securing social order through what Goffman has called territories of the self. Second, I explore how the atmosphere can be thought of as a turbulent medium that links fluid dynamics with affective properties. And third, I show that permeability is the central feature of atmospheric milieus, which has consequences for how we adapt traditional notions of social interaction. And I will finish the investigation with a brief note on the relation between the social and the natural sciences and their respective 
knowledge forms. In the repertoire of infectious disease control, the injunction to keep a distance between one to two meters has remained in place throughout the pandemic. The spatial norm materializes, as we all know, in the form of floor markings, barrier tape, sometimes also verbal reprimand in case of a physical approximation deemed too close. Whereas something like a coughing etiquette has long been part of hygiene behavior, COVID-19 establishes what Nick Brown and colleagues uh, call a supplementary et etiquette of spacing, an etiquette of spacing that human bodies have to exercise in relation to each other. Drawing on Irving Goffman's sociology of relations in public, we can describe this development in territorial terms. Goffman adopted the notion of territory from ethology to illuminate the intricate organization of social interactions. By using markers, individuals demarcate territories of the self that express claims about who can approach them in what fashion, through bodily proximity or through touch, indirectly, through so um, indirectly through accessing things or through noises and looks. Territory in this sense is a social ordering mechanism that operates through carving the environment. It inscribes norms about how to relate into spatial renderings. Against this backdrop, the distinctive feature of the physical distancing rule under COVID-19 uh, COVID is its almost universal validity across very different situations. It is supposed to have the same measurements in many public settings, irrespective of the particular persons involved. The German government, for instance, has in the formula refers to hygiene, the second A to wearing masks, the, the first A stands for Abstand in German, which is distance. As the formula illustrates pretty well, COVID-19 has given rise to a territorial meta convention that remediates norms bound to specific contexts. Crucially now, the safety promise connected to this territorial ordering is at stake in the, in the controversy about aerosols because it is based on the premise that SARS-CoV-2 tra travels via droplets. The distinction between aerosols and droplets often refers to, to the size of particles. As such, it has itself become a matter of controversy. Some public health institutions, including WHO, determining the dividing line at five micrometers. Scholars from atmospheric science, however, suggest to understand aerosols not from what they are, but from what they do. They distinguish, in other words, performances. On top of the list of actions that qualify an aerosol is the ability to enter the respiratory tract. Particles can be inhaled up to a size of 100 micrometers. Equally important, aerosols and droplets perform different styles of movement when suspended in the air. Droplets fall to the ground after a short time span, which also implies a limited horizontal range. Aerosols, in contrast, are ideally airborne particles 
as it is sometimes um, said, by, said by experts. This simply means that they defy gravity. Like dust or cigarette smoke, they can travel across larger distances and stay afloat in the air for longer time spans. As a precautionary measure, physical distancing is thus primarily attuned to the behavior of droplets. When facing the performances of aerosols, its protective impact, although not fully undone, remains deficient. Since the onset of the pandemic, several epidemiological case studies have been published that describe aerosols in action. They illuminate scenes of infection and re-problematize the spatial relation between human bodies. An outbreak event on January 24 and 2020 at a restaurant in Guangzhou, China, has been one of the first documented cases where the infection could not be fully explained by droplet transmission since it occurred at several tables over a distance uh, up to 4.6 meters. Video camera footage showed that the persons involved did not have close contacts or spoke with each other. The subsequent simulation with a tracer gas detected the interplay of two atmospheric factors. First, there was very little supply of outdoor air due to low ventilation rates. And this accounted for a high virus concentration in the ambient air. Second, <clears throat> the air condition formed what the authors call a contaminated recirculation bubble that you can also see on the slide here. Uh, the slide is uh, the fi figure from the paper. A contaminated recirculation bubble that enveloped the affected three neighboring tables. <clears throat> An investigation of another outbreak at a meat processing plant in Germany in May 2020 even documented a transmission within a distance of over eight meters. In addition to also stressing the role of low air exchange rates and indoor air flows, the authors added, and I quote, climate conditions to the set of factors that contribute to contagious atmospheres. Temperatures cooled down to 10 degrees, increased the viability of the virus. Furthermore, the study also highlights the importance of heavy breathing, in this case, due to physically demanding work. Both case studies show that airborne transmission exceeds attempts at territorialization. Territories usually not only depend on some aspects of fortification. First and foremost, they need to be demarcated. Yet the inscription of boundaries into air is notoriously difficult. Verbal announcements perpetuate the, uh, and increase the risk of infection since the air is both the medium of communication and of communicability. Most notably, air has deterritorializing properties. The challenges at stake are well known, for example, from the history of warfare. Any release of biological and also chemical agents into the air has to reckon with the possibility of changing winds. In the everyday case, it is hard to, in the end, everyday case of COVID-19, of course, it is hard to enclose those aerosols that are continuously emitted in breathing, talking, or singing. They do not respect boundaries, at least in situations without particular soci socio-technical equipment. In our everyday routines, we have drawn the consequence of uh, to increase the volatility of the medium. We open windows and switch on ventilation. Confronted with such flow conditions, the concept of territory shows its own limits. As Goffman himself has remarked, the territory is a contour, not a sphere. 
If social scientists want to follow the airborne path for thinking the atmos social condition, they have to move from the territorial to the atmospheric. The step into the atmosphere is a transition, first of all, into three dimensional space. It adds a vertical dimension to the horizontal plane on which social intercourse is usually, usually situated. If verticality appears in the social sciences at all, then mostly in diagrams either of domination or inequality, sovereign power or stratification. In comparison, the ecologies of breath under COVID-19 have forced us to grapple with a thick milieu in which bodily relations merge with vapors and effluvia. Accordingly, the main concern today is to secure atmospheric volumes. As I want to elaborate now, the atmospheric volumes of COVID-19 are irreducibly infused with uncertainty. Their composition defies volumetric certainty. The turbulence of fluids intersects with the turbulence of affects. The urge to gain better knowledge about the spread of SARS-CoV-2 has motivated physicists to explore the fluid dynamics at work in contagious interaction. In the words of Lydia Burubia from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the MIT, the aim is to understand the mechanisms by which fluids shape the dispersal and transmission of pathogens. That is, they are in their encapsulation in a host, their emission, their ecological persistence in the environment, and the new host infiltration. Modeling this process, the focus lies on the, and I further quote here, the fully turbulent flow of a puff cloud of hot and moist air released by breathing bodies. Without digging too much into the intricacies of physics here, I want to suggest that turbulent fluids are good to think with also for scholars in the social sciences and the humanities. To begin with, the dynamics described by Burubia occur exactly at the scale of the atmosocial. This sets them apart from the scales at which molecular biology and population epidemiology operate, those two knowledge formations that played a key role in public debates during the pandemic. Furthermore, turbulent fluids offer a very useful model of order. The philosopher of science, Michel Serre, suggests to think of turbulence in terms of the Lucretian notion of the Kleinerman. The Kleinerman, this is the, the small deviation of moving matter from a linear path that results in, chains, in, in chance collisions or encounters. The unpredictable deviation or swerve accounts for turbulent interactions. This does not simply amount to a disorderly state. The fluctuation of the, of the swerve rather inserts a stochastic element into the constitution of order and thereby an irreducible degree of uncertainty. This has important implications for everyday encounters in and with atmospheres of COVID-19. One never knows precisely where a potentially virus-laden cloud ends. Clouds in general have fuzzy boundaries, yet they not only contain a speculative quality regarding their exact whereabouts, but also their very composition. Due to their turbulent state, clouds form heterogeneous mixtures 
that constantly evolve, which makes them hard to reckon with. Of course, during the pandemic, several attempts at rendering airborne exposure, uh, at rendering airborne exposure calculable took place. Large news, newspapers, as here, for instance, the German Die Zeit, have put simulations of aerosol dispersion on their websites, modeling different socio-spatial settings, such as classrooms, restaurants, or offices. Yet the multiplicity of influences, from background air flow, flow to thermal effects, impedes an exact knowledge about the dynamics of airborne disease transmission. The speculative quality of encounter in and with atmospheres of COVID-19 refers to the link between two aspects, their elemental composition and their affective charge. Both aspects are key constituents of the atmosocial. Scholars from the humanities have emphasized that atmospheres are not only, ex, uh, not only extensive, but also intensive entities. Atmospheres let bodies breathe freely or make them suffer from their oppressive climate up to the point at which people feel they might suffocate. Such atmospheric effects are not to be understood as projections of an emotional subject. Instead, atmospheres emanate from the relational interplay of the elements involved. According to Gernot Böhme, things and bodies of all sorts suffuse a situation and produce, I quote him here, an indeterminate, spatially extended quality of feeling. They not only tune, but tincture their environment. This notion of tincturing resonates with the etymology of infection, which includes the meaning of staining something in the sense that it becomes tainted, spoiled, or corrupted, as Temkin has shown. By stating that the atmosphere is now, in Burma's words again, something which flows forth spatially, almost something like a breath or a haze, Burma here invokes epidemiological notions like the miasma and the effluvia. The notion of effluvia referred until the late 19th century to the pathogenic vapor around sick bodies. The current controversy around virus-laden aerosols brings us again into closer proximity to such atmospheric models of transmission. The link between actual breathing spaces and affective envelopment appears prominently also in discussions about the different modes of infection at the turn towards the 20th century discussions that are important since they pushed the airborne pathway into the background. At the time, interestingly, several experiments had already provided evidence that bacteria could indeed stay in the air for prolonged periods of time and also travel several meters. However, looking at historical sources, it seems that the possibility of what was called volatile contagions was mainly rejected due to concerns about interferences with established health measures. In his influential book, The Sources and Modes of Infection from 1910, Charles Chapin discards the possibility of airborne transmission mainly on the basis of an affective calculus. He writes, infection by air, if it does take place, as is commonly believed, is so difficult to avoid or guard against that it discourages effort to avoid other sources of danger, end of quote. 
So in Chapin's view here, the threat of infection would be so pervasive that people would become demotivated to take precautions such as keeping one's distance. For Chapin, physical distance was the most effective measure against what he called contact infection, and which included both infection via droplets and contaminated surfaces. If the sick room, he rhetorically ask, asked, if the sick room is filled with floating contagium, of what use is it to make such an effort to guard against contact infection? And he concluded that it will be a great relief to most persons to be freed from the specter of infected air. As you can see, the affective relaxation thus goes hand in hand with the aim of generating commitment to control measures against contact infection. Scholars from the social sciences and the humanities have stressed that atmospheres are not primarily structures of meaning. Atmospheres rather assume a felt presence that is bodily sensed. 19th century sanitary assumptions about relations between smell and health in the modern industrial city are a case in point. The perception of foul airs, stenches, and olfactory nuisances generated atmospheric anxieties about safe breathing. And I take this from Melanie Kiesler's great book about smell detective, wonderful book. The virus-laden aerosols uh, of the present, they differ in this respect. In their case, perception has to deal with imperceptible elements. At least our all to human sensorium fails at registering the aerosol that concerns us exactly in its withdrawal, as if the navigational capacities of our perceptual apparatus were perturbed by foggy surroundings. All the more intensely felt is the uncertainty about the atmospheric interplay between human bodies, particles, viruses, and air currents. This highly indeterminate potential to infect and be infected makes atmospheres of COVID-19 so volatile. As Böhme soberly remarked regarding atmospheres in general, we are unsure where they are. Dealing in her fieldwork with the H5N1 influenza, influenza that is also spread uh, via the aerosol pathway, the anthropologist Celia Lowy aptly speaks of cloudy insecurities. With the radical uncertainty surrounding the atmospheric contact zones, the discomfort zones, so to speak, multiply. Especially the figure of the healthy carrier without symptoms is prone to materialize effectively as a kind of background suspicion. In the extreme, this suspicion may grow into a paranoia about the imperceptible atmospheric infiltration of pathogenic mixtures. <clears throat> In his philosophy of elemental media, John Durham Peters laconically claims that ontology is not flat, it is cloudy. With this statement, Peters, I think it's pretty clear, uh, he distances himself from Bruno Latour's notion of a flat ontology of actor networks and expresses instead a preference for conceiving being as atmospheric. Implicitly, he opposes two-dimensional to three-dimensional spaces, clear-cut edges to fuzzy boundaries, solid associations to turbulent fluids, the dry to the wet, and not at least, connectivity between nodes 
on the one hand, to sensitivity to the weather on the other hand. In the last step of my lecture, I want to expand on this list of attributes that circumscribe the contours of the atmosocial condition um, which, uh, which the COVID-19 pandemic has imposed upon us. And I will show that life in clouds forces us to attend to the permeability of bodies and environment. This permeability has important consequences for sociological concepts of relationality and relatedness. In scientific articles and public communication, we find several visual representations that depict scenes of airborne transmission between humans. Sociologically, these representations are diagrams that display a mode of relatedness, particular to ecologies of breath. <clears throat> in the figure that uh, you see on the slide, aerosols in three different sizes float around interact interacting bodies. The index case on the left is envisioned as a cloud body, a notion that I again borrow from Nick Brown and colleague, a body surrounded by a communicable mist. The body of the index case almost morphs into its bioaerosol emissions, the entity of dispersal becomes a dis dispersed entity. The exposed contact on the right side inhales the aerosols. How deep the particles invade the respiratory uh, tract depends on the particle size. The contrast to the two other transmission pathways is, I think, instructive for understanding the atmosocial. Even if all three pathways imply a moment of microbes leaving and entering organisms, the aerosol component relativizes the idea of the body as a discrete entity most strongly. Bodies are marked by porous boundaries that render them vulnerable in ecologies of breath. COVID-19 has foregrounded the atmospheric biointimacy bodies in proximity are involved in. At the same time, this intimacy of life and shared atmospheres is not equivalent to the classical sociological concept of interaction. In fact, both the transmission via droplets and via the handling of uh, contaminated objects are closer tied to interactive behaviors, either through ballistically firing droplets while uh, speaking at each other or through touch. The volatility and aerial persistence of aerosols, in contrast, extends the atmosocial beyond interactive settings. The study mentioned above about uh, the COVID-19 outbreak in a restaurant is illustrative since the infected individuals did not interact across the different tables at which they were seated. Other representations of airborne transmission depict, for instance, scenes of people standing next to each other in public transport vehicles. In the atmosocial, thus, intimacies of shared breath result from a type of relation that is, in many cases, interpassive and not interactive. Activities between persons are not necessary to enter an atmosocial relation. Mutual passivity suffices. A look at another case study may help, may help to develop this point further. Uh, this case study that I'm um, pointing out here by Kang and uh, colleagues uh, is an investigation of an outbreak of nine confirmed COVID-19 cases in early 2020 that most likely took place 
via fecal aerosols in a high-rise building in Guangzhou, China. The three infected families lived in vertically aligned flats. A simulation experiment with tracer gas provides evidence that, and I quote from the study, bioaerosols were generated during toilet flushing and then spread via the draining, uh, via the draining stacks and vents across 12 floors. The study underscores the complexity of fluid dynamics occurring in the built environment. Differences in, uh, differences in air pressure, the geometry of drainage infrastructure, wind speed, the buoyancy effect in vent and stack pipes all play a role. These dynamics involve the residents in an atmosocial intimacy that bears traces of what ranges among the most abject encounters imaginable, an encounter mediated through, and I quote from the study, the bioaerosolization of wastewater mixed with urine, feces, and exhaled mucus, end of quote. Here, the uncanny appearance of the atmosocial is pushed to the extreme due to the introduction of a radical otherness into the homely, both repulsive and threatening. However, one does not have to do much to engage in this effectively highly laden mode of elemental intercourse. According to the authors of the case study, the infected persons very likely never met face to face in the period under investigation. Their atmosocial encounter did not even take place in the form of an interpassive relation as it might have occurred, for instance, in the elevator, where people usually entertain a social relation marked by the avoidance of interaction. Bodies do not have to be with each other at the same time in the same room. To enter an atmosocial relation, it is enough to live alongside, understood as a form as a very particular form of relationality that um, Joanna Lettimer has described in this article that I'm referencing here. The atmosocial, in under COVID-19, we, we have to learn that uh, painfully that the atmosocial has the, capaci the capacity to befall us or to invade those living alongside. On a more general plane, the case study highlights the intricate link between atmospheres and habitation. In her book, The Forgetting of Air in Martin Heidegger, Luz Irigaray rhetorically asks, is not air the whole of our habitation as mortals? Can man live elsewhere than in air? The virus-laden aerosol cloud is an elemental medium that is part of the habitat, especially when it comes to the inhabitation of indoor spaces. Its properties pose a challenge to what we have come to understand as hygiene. Traditionally, most hygiene practices seek to sanitize points of bodily contact in order to prevent the incursion of germs into human organisms. But seen through the lens of the aerosol, the dispensers with hand sanitizers, they stand quite uselessly at the entrances of shops, universities, or administrative buildings. Experts on environmental health and air quality have made the compelling case, <clears throat> excuse me, the compelling case to consider building ventilation systems as a relevant machineries for infection control. The atmosocial is thus envisioned as a technologically highly mediated space, a matter for engineering solutions. Whereas air conditioning was predominantly concerned with comfort in the 20th century, 
COVID-19 seems to advance a new variant of aerial hygiene. Ventilation rates and filtering capacities became key parameters for atmospheric safety. However, the purification of the atmospheric habitat has limits, as even those authors here readily concede that argue most forcefully to include building ventilation systems into the arsenal of public health technologies. They write, air as a contagion medium is nebulous, widespread, not owned by anybody and uncontained, end of quote. Especially the permeability of bodies by their aerial habitat complicates hygiene measures. It indicates a disease ecology that has similarities with those resulting from pesticide use in agriculture or from radiation. The difference lies in the active contribution that bodies make to the constitution of their habitat. Bodies bathe in the atmospheres that they co-produce. They are immersed in the emissions resulting from their conviviality. On the one hand, bodies are vital forces immanent to their milieu. They always already changed the atmosphere on which they depend through their mere presence. As Emma Garnett has pointed out in her analysis of computer simulations of indoor airflows, occupant bodies were shown to participate in the way buildings breathe. At the same time, bodies are pervaded by their aerial milieu. Relations via gaseous, moist, and fluid elements are not relations between discrete entities. Bodies become enmeshed rather than entangled with their surroundings. Entanglement, I think, still being too much of a network-related figure. Life in cloudy ecologies of breath thus foregrounds what Jane Bennett has called the non-human powers circulating around and within human bodies. Powers emanating from speaking and working bodies, depending on their number and their behavior, their dwell time and their individual viral load, architectural and infrastructural designs, window openings and ventilation systems, temperature and humidity. Taking into account these relations that impact on atmosocial encounters is very different from, di from disinfecting a contaminated surface or from keeping a safety difference. Let me conclude. I have focused on the problematization of airborne transmission in the context of SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. The practical stakes are obviously high, still high. This controversy not only harbors important implications for how to organize interactive and interpassive relations in order to minimize infection risks, it also has the ability to change the epistemic constitution of public health. At least to my impression, the field of public health expertise has been reopened during the COVID-19 pandemic. Suddenly, atmospheric chemists, physicists, and building engineers are claiming a greater authority in a field long dominated by microbiologists and population epidemiologists. Faced with the intricacies of what aerosol clouds can actually do in ecologies of breath, these very heterogeneous expert knowledges have entered in what, into what the historian of science, Peter Gallison, has once called a trading zone. However, my ultimate goal was not, or at least not primarily, to analyze a transformation of knowledge. Instead, my aim was to approach the debate over airborne transmission as an event that contains a conceptual lesson for sociology. I have approached a knowledge formation far removed from the sociological orbit to obtain impulses 
to understand a particular societal aggregate, a societal aggregate that I termed the ethnosocial and that has gained practical virulence since early 2020. Following the airborne pathway, I have delineated three trajectories. Thinking with aerosols first extends the flat territorial organization into turbulent volumes. Second, it couples the fluid dynamics of respiratory life with the affective dynamics of highly uncertain atmospheric encounters. And third, it transposes a world of discrete relations with demarcated boundaries into a world of permeable aerial habitats in which it suffices to live alongside each other to establish an atmosocial contact. Unfolding these atmosocial implications enshrined in the controversy over airborne transmission is, I think, the prerequisite that the social sciences and the humanities can play a role in discussions about health impacts of breathing and air conditioning in the future. I think that this project will have succeeded if our disciplines have also entered this training zone. Thank you. Wonderful lecture, uh, taking us uh, across 